Hello, it's Doug again, and thank you for signing up for my S1H Masterclass. I'm going to go ahead and assume you've already watched the trailer for this video series, and so you should already have a pretty good idea of who I am and why I'm so excited about the S1H. The time for talking about all the great features of the S1H is over. Now it's time for me to get down to business and help you get up to speed shooting great video as quickly as possible. At this point during one of my masterclass videos, I like to lay the groundwork for all the rest of the chapters by taking a quick tour around the camera to help you get familiar with the external buttons and controls, and then we'll come back to them in later chapters for more details. Now because the S1H is not an entry level camera, I'm going to proceed with the assumption that you already have some experience under your belt shooting video professionally and you have at least a basic understanding of the general principles of television film production. You won't find any filler in this training video on general topics that would apply to all cameras, such as depth of field, composition, lighting, and so forth. In this workshop, we want to stay focused as much as possible on the most important features and functions of the S1H. So let's get started, because as I like to say, we've got a lot of ground to cover. I think the best place to begin is with the mode dial right here. In fact, I would say that it is the most important control on the entire camera because this is where you decide if the camera is going to be used for taking photos or shooting video. Now, during this masterclass, we're only going to be shooting video, so the mode dial can be set on this position, the Panasonic calls creative video, nearly 100% of the time, with just a couple of exceptions in Chapter 6, we will never change it. Now, although it's still possible to record video while the dial is in one of the other positions, many of the video-related functions won't work properly, or possibly not at all. So when you're shooting video, you need to be in the creative video mode. To turn the dial, first press down on the release button in the center. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's one more setting that you're going to want to change to avoid some frustration during the next few minutes. If your camera has never been used before, then you'll notice that the shutter speed and iris settings are probably grayed out right now and cannot be changed. That's because the default exposure mode for the creative video setting of the mode dial is programmed auto exposure, and you don't ever want to use that. The fastest way to get out of that mode is to tap the icon shown here on the touchscreen, highlight manual exposure, and then press set. Now we're ready to move ahead. Right next to the mode dial, we find a lever that controls the drive mode. And like many features on the S1H, this control has nothing to do with shooting video, so it can just be ignored. Next, we have the lock lever that can be used to disable some of the camera settings so you can't accidentally change them. There's even a menu that allows you to designate which camera controls are locked whenever the lever is engaged. But my recommendation is not to use the lock lever at all. All of the functions that can be locked are things you shouldn't ever want to have locked. If you're worried about accidentally pressing buttons or rotating dials, my advice is just learn to be more careful. Next to the lock lever, we find the camera's playback button. If you press it once, the last clip that was recorded will pop up and be ready to play back if you tap the LCD touchscreen. Unfortunately, I find the playback controls to be quite primitive and difficult to use when compared to other video cameras. In fact, if you have a monitor or external recorder connected to the camera via the HDMI jack, you won't be able to play back videos at all. My advice is to avoid playing back videos in the field. Next, we have the viewfinder, which has excellent picture quality and is a pleasure to use. One reason the viewfinder is so good is because it has an organic LED screen, or OLED for short. An OLED display works without a backlight, thus it can display deep black levels and achieve higher contrast ratios than a normal LCD viewfinder. By the way, please don't confuse the touchscreen LCD monitor with the viewfinder. When I speak about the LCD panel or monitor, I'm talking about this. And when I speak about the viewfinder, I'm talking about this. Whatever you do, don't forget to take a second to adjust the optics of the eyepiece by turning the diopter wheel so that the image in the viewfinder precisely matches your own eyesight. This step is critically important, yet I know a lot of people never bother to do it. Something to be aware of is that you can't use the viewfinder and the LCD monitor at the same time. No matter what you do with the camera switches or menus, you can only see a picture on one or the other at any given time. In fact, that limitation may lead you to think that something is wrong with your camera because you may notice that the picture on the LCD screen will suddenly turn off and back on again as if it has a short circuit. But don't worry, your camera is not defective. 
the camera uses a small motion sensor right here to detect when you're looking through the viewfinder, and then it will automatically switch the video output as necessary between the viewfinder and the LCD panel. Unfortunately, the proximity sensor can be easily fooled by anything that comes within about two inches of the viewfinder, and that can cause the picture to come and go unexpectedly until you get used to how it works. I really like having the freedom of being able to go back and forth seamlessly between the viewfinder and the LCD monitor as often as I want. But if you find it annoying to have the LCD regularly blanking out unexpectedly, there is a menu that will allow you to choose one or the other 100% of the time. But I strongly recommend that you don't change it because the monitor and viewfinder each have unique functionality and you don't want to lose out on using the features they each offer. I think that once you get used to the way the eye sensor works, you'll be happy with it, so give it a chance. On the left side of the viewfinder, we find a button labeled LVF that does the same thing as the menu that I just mentioned. If you want to turn off the eye sensor and only use the monitor or the viewfinder, you can press the button to cycle through the three modes. Now this seems like a good time to stop and talk about the tremendous power the camera gives you for customizing nearly every button, knob, switch, and dial on the camera. As I just said, the LVF button allows you to turn off the eye sensor, but that's only if the button is still set for its default function. On my camera, I'd never want to turn the eye sensor off, so I've customized this button so that it does something else that is more useful to me. I'll talk about what that function is in a later chapter, but for now, I just want you to appreciate how handy it can be to customize the buttons on your camera to give you faster access to features that might otherwise require getting into the menus. Diving into the menus to turn some things on or off can't be avoided completely, but my goal is to minimize that wasted energy by using external controls as much as possible. Located directly over on the opposite side of the viewfinder is a button that allows you to cycle between three different levels of magnification for the viewfinder, if that is something you want to do. Personally, I like the middle magnification setting the best and I have no reason to ever change it. So once again, we have another button that is useless to me in its default mode, but can be reprogrammed for some other function that is more useful to me instead. So my advice is to press the button a few times to find the magnification that looks best to your eye and then reprogram the button for something else that will be more useful to you. I'll talk about how I've customized this button on my camera when we get to chapter four, but you may not agree with that choice either. That is the great thing about having so many customizable buttons. We can each create the camera that best suits our needs. On top of the camera, hidden under a plastic cover, we find the hot shoe. One use of the hot shoe is to mount a flash when taking photos, but an even more powerful function for those of us who are shooting video is to mount Panasonic's optional XLR1 adapter, which gives the camera two XLR microphone connectors and a host of other external switches and dials for controlling sound recording. If you're familiar with Sony's K2M adapter for their cameras, the Panasonic XLR1 is essentially the same thing. Not only does it pass audio to the camera, but it also gets its power from the camera, thus eliminating extra batteries, wires, and messy cables. In my opinion, the S1H isn't even really a complete camcorder without the XLR1 adapter, and I strongly recommend you get one. For less than $400, it greatly enhances the performance of the camera and is well worth the money. Next, we come to the status LCD that displays some of the camera's most important settings, including such things as the shutter speed, f-stop, gain, crop mode, and others. I suppose this is a handy screen to have, but in all honesty, I rarely find myself looking at it. As we'll see in a few minutes, all of this information and more can be displayed on the LCD screen at the rear of the camera, where it is brighter and easier to read. Next we have the red video record button, which once again, I have reprogrammed to do something else because I absolutely hate the location of this button. I don't know if it's just the shape of my hands or what, but I find it virtually impossible to press the button with my index finger while I'm holding the camera in my hands. And obviously starting and stopping recording is something I have to do all the time. Now, fortunately, when the camera is set for the video mode, we don't have to use this red button to start recording. We can just use the regular shutter button up here to trigger recording, which just happens to be perfectly positioned for my index finger. In the video mode, photos can't be taken, so this button is perfect to start or stop recording. Also, while we're on the topic of the shutter button, there are two ways that it can be used. Pressing it down fully will start or stop recording, but pressing it down lightly halfway is the best way to exit the menus and return the camera to the normal shooting mode. I'm sure you've already discovered that turning the camera on or off is done with the power switch that encircles the shutter button. 
And if you turn a little farther, you can light up the status LCD for a few seconds. On the front of the camera, you'll find one of the camera's three dials. This one is appropriately named the front dial. In the camera's default mode, this dial is used to open or close the iris of the lens, assuming, of course, that the lens is capable of being controlled by the camera. This is an absolutely critical control for setting an exposure, so I have not changed the programming of this button. A second dial, this one called the rear dial, is located right here, and its primary use is to control the camera's shutter speed. Now, this is another critical control that often needs to be changed manually, so I have not reprogrammed this button either. We'll talk a lot more about shutter speed, iris, and other topics having to do with exposure in Chapter 10. This row of three buttons are used to change the white balance, the camera sensitivity, which may be called ISO or gain, depending on how you have your camera configured. We'll talk about how to make that choice later, and exposure compensation. All three of these buttons can be customized, not only for what functions they control, but also how they work when they're pressed. I've customized all three of mine, but we'll talk about that later in Chapter 4. For now, while they're in their default mode, you can press the button for the setting you want to change, and then rotate one of the three dials to select a new setting. Moving to the front of the camera, we find an autofocus assist light that serves no purpose when shooting video. Next, we've got function button number one and function button number two. Neither one of them has any default programming that works while shooting video, so they'll both be wasted unless you take the time to give them an assignment. In Chapter 4, I'll have some suggestions for what you might want to do with them. Down below the function buttons, we find the Lens Release button, and its function ought to be self-explanatory. The native lens mount for the S1H is called an L-mount, which is a relatively new mount that was created through a partnership among Leica, Sigma, and Panasonic. Now, similar in design to Sony's E-mount, but not compatible with, the L-mount has a very short flange distance of 20 millimeters, thus facilitating more compact lens construction and better compatibility with adapters made for lenses with other types of mounts, such as Canon, Nikon, and PL. I have an L-mount to PL adapter from Wooden Camera that allows me to use my whole inventory of cinema lenses with the S1H. Now, PL is the industry standard for movie cameras and generally offers smoother focusing performance and stepless iris changes. Some of my telephoto PL lenses, such as this red 300mm, cover the full frame sensor. But all of my PL lenses under 50mm, such as this Sony 35mm Prime, can only be used in the S1H's Super 35mm crop mode without vignetting around the edges. PL adapters are considered dumb adapters because there's no electronic communication between the camera and the lens. On the other hand, Canon EF lenses can be mounted on the S1H using a Sigma MC21 adapter that does provide electronic communication to facilitate autofocus, iris adjustments, and even image stabilization. Canon EF lenses are a great option for the S1H because they're all designed to cover full frame sensors with no vignetting. Over on the opposite side of the lens, we find another record button. This can be reprogrammed for some other function if you prefer, but I like to keep it as an alternative way to start and stop recording when I'm shooting from a tripod. Traditionally, shoulder mount ENG cameras have had a record button underneath the lens in about this same place, so I guess that's why it just feels natural to me to have a record button located down here. Up here, under a plastic cap, we find a socket that serves a couple of different purposes. During still photography, it can be used to connect a flash to the camera, but for video, it has an even more important role to play because this is the timecode in-out connector that facilitates jamming timecode to other cameras on a multi-camera shoot. The S1H can serve as a slave or master, whichever way works better for you. And believe it or not, Panasonic even includes the necessary cable with the camera, so everyone has one. The cable has a flash connector at one end and a standard BNC connector on the other. Now, as you know, having synchronous timecode numbers recorded on each camera during a multi-camera shoot is worth its weight in gold when it comes time for editing. Just one more example of how the S1H has clearly been designed for serious professionals who value speed and efficiency. We'll talk more about timecode in Chapter 17. The last feature on the front of the camera is the tally light, which can be turned off if you don't want it announcing to the world that you're recording. I'll show you how to disable it in Chapter 5 if that's what you want to do. On the left side of the camera, located under a couple of rubber covers, we have a jack for connecting a remote control, a 3.5 millimeter microphone jack, a headphone jack, a USB port, and a full-size HDMI connector. 
Moving to the rear of the camera, we find the rear tally light, which can be turned off or on independently from the front tally light. Next, we have the focus mode lever, which surrounds the autofocus mode button. Unfortunately, I find autofocus on the S1H to be almost completely worthless. There's one exception that I'll talk about in chapter 12, but even it's nothing to get very excited about. Autofocus performance is really the Achilles heel of the camera. So if you want to shoot professional video with the S1H, then you better get used to manual focusing. Fortunately, as we'll see later, there are a number of focus assist features on the camera that can help make it easier. Right next door to the focus mode button, we've got the autofocus on button, which I'm happy to say, and as you'll see in chapter 12, can be pressed momentarily to let the camera focus the lens automatically. In my opinion, this is the only autofocus function on the camera that is worth using. Located just below the focus button, we have the joystick, which, you guessed it, can also be customized in many different ways. On my camera, I have it programmed to help with manual focusing. Next, we've got the Q button, which stands for Quick Menu. As the name implies, the purpose of this button is to quickly access a number of settings all in one place. And even better, you get to choose what those settings are and how they are arranged. For example, when I press the Q button on my camera, I guarantee you that the screen that comes up looks nothing like what the camera shows when the same button is pressed on your camera, because I've customized my Q button already. I've got quick access to settings for dual native gain, color bars, the recording format, the photo style, variable frame rate for slow motion, white balance, grid lines to help with composition, two different image stabilizer settings, the crop mode, the audio limiter, and even a handy overlay to help keep the camera level. We'll talk more about customizing the Q menu when we get to chapter four. Next, we have the main control dial, which serves many purposes. Sometimes you'll use it to navigate the menus. Sometimes you use it to adjust the headphone volume, and other times you can use it to select a clip for playback. In the center of the control dial, we find the all important menu and set button. And this button happens to be one of the few buttons that you cannot customize. If you want to jump back one level in the menu hierarchy or cancel selection that you've made, that is the purpose of the cancel or back button. Over here, there's the delete or trash can button. I don't ever delete clips on the S1H when I'm out on a shoot, so this button would be worthless to me if I hadn't reprogrammed it. On my camera, I use it to give me one touch access to the variable frame rate mode which is Panasonic's terminology for slow motion. Anytime I want to roll off some nice slow-mo, I just hit the button, turn it on, choose a frame rate, and I'm ready to go in just a matter of seconds. The final button on the camera that I want to mention is the display button. Pressing the display button will allow you to cycle through the camera's four display modes. Full information, no information, the control panel, which can only be shown on the LCD monitor, and off. Throughout this masterclass, you'll notice that sometimes the display that I'm showing on my camera looks different than what you're seeing on your camera. Most of your icons are going to be overlaid on a black border that goes around the perimeter of the screen, while my icons are going to be superimposed over the picture itself. And don't worry about that difference. That is just a quirk of the camera when I'm using the HDMI output. I only mention it so that you don't mistakenly think there is something you can do to change the display in your camera to look like this.